technology. It feels as if the more technology advances, the harder and harder it gets to commit a crime. Computers, cameras, digital footprints, facial recognition, larger and faster databases, GPS tracking, touch DNA, doorbell cams, modern ballistics, even photo ID. All these things, these tools, are used against killers in order to help bring them to justice for their victims. Depending on where you go and how far you travel, it's almost impossible to avoid being tracked, especially if you have a cell phone. And as cameras get better, smaller, and cheaper, gone will be the days where moving about anonymously is even an option, and that's before we even add in artificial intelligence. Now, it's still possible to do, possible to remain unnoticed, but a conscious decision must be made in order to fly under the radar low enough to avoid detection. Such was not the case, though, for our next subject, a man who, after murdering over five people, was not only arrested, but arrested twice for other crimes, while he was still wanted in multiple states for crimes ranging from burglary to homicide. He was able to present stolen identification to officers, and they bought it. There is a fine line between losing your privacy and independence and experiencing more perceived safety. In other words, how much of your freedom are you willing to exchange for safety? It's a hard question if you really think about it, because being safe isn't exactly free, and being completely free isn't exactly safe. Hopefully, we as a society can find that line, find that perfect exchange, but until then there are going to be mistakes, going to be cases like that of Daniel Lee Siebert. I'm Chase Ellerman, and this is Almost Fiction. Chapter 1. Dorothy P. Richards was the child of a failed marriage, one that her mother entered in at 15, and when it was finally over, Dorothy found herself placed in the foster system. After many lonely years in the system, and at 15 years old herself, Dorothy was not one to learn from her mother's mistake and lies on a marriage certificate and is married to a 22-year-old man named Melvin. Not even a year later, he picks up and moves, leaving his wife and daughter in the rear view. Now a single mother in 1950s America, Dorothy struggles to get by before meeting a man by the name of Erwin Siebert. Erwin didn't seem to care that Dorothy had not only been married before, but he also didn't care that she was a single mother, and soon the two tied the knot with their first and only child, Danny, being born seven months later on June 17, 1954, in Mattoon, Illinois. Daniel, or Danny as he was called by his family, lived most of his life in fear fear of what his father might do to him at any moment for almost any reason. Later, Daniel's mother, Dorothy, had this to say about Danny and his father's relationship. Quote, He did hit him some, but I think it was mainly his attitude. He never wanted to spend any time with him. He didn't bother with him. He was not an understanding man. End quote. Danny spent a lot of time by himself, mostly in an attempt to keep away from his dad and the beatings. He had a few different hobbies to keep him busy, but nothing ever really compared to his artwork. He was good, spending hours and hours alone creating new and incredible worlds where he was safe. March 6, 1967. Erwin Siebert is angry. His good-for-nothing son Danny had been nothing but trouble this past week, and he was going to put an end to it once and for all. He stewed on his own anger the entire drive home from work, and as soon as he saw that stupid face, he just lost it. He was yelling, swinging, and kicking. His knuckles burned and ached, but it just felt so good. Then she stepped in. Dorothy. Well, it was about time that she learned her lesson as well. Danny was his son, and he knew what it would take to finally straighten that damn kid out. 
pushing his wife back, he told her that she was next before once again laying in to Danny. Dorothy watched helplessly as her husband beat her son. She heard the blows, the crying, saw the blood. She was done. This was it. It was over. Danny survived that day, but the marriage did not. On May 20th, 1968, the divorce was finalized and Dorothy received full custody of Danny, as well as $20 a week in child support. Irwin didn't fight the judgment. Danny's mother remarried one year after the divorce from Erwin Siebert, and around the same time, Danny's juvenile record began. He started small, mostly stealing items from his own family, with his petty crimes eventually growing into truancy and even bigger thefts from there. Danny continued his negative and escalating behavior until 1968, when he was sent to a state-run boys' home where he lived for three years. In 1971, Danny ran away. With nowhere else to go, he lived on the streets. Soon, he developed a drug addiction, and in order to pay for his addiction, he began working as a male prostitute before once again he was arrested, and since he was still a juvenile, he was sent to the Illinois Youth Center, a home with even more rules and restrictions than the boys' home he lived in before. Unable to escape from this form of a prison, Danny spent the rest of his youth at the Illinois Youth Center until he finally turned 18. After aging out of the juvenile program he was in, Daniel Siebert found himself out on the street with nothing to his name and nowhere to go. Not wanting to return to his previous life of selling himself for cash, Daniel instead decides to join the Marines. He tried to make it, tried to fit in, but only 12 months after enlisting, Danny went AWOL and because of this, he was dishonorably discharged. With nothing keeping him in Illinois, Daniel begins to make his way out west. Reconnecting with his childhood passion, Daniel begins to make a living by painting murals and signs for businesses as he makes his way further and further towards California, finally arriving at the tail end of 1972. For the next three years, he lives in California and even fathers a son and daughter, but unable to find steady work as an artist, Daniel goes back to what he knows, crime. It started with theft and drugs, but as the years continued to pass, his behavior escalated and soon he was charged with multiple counts of assault and battery. Then in 1978, Daniel opts for a fresh start, but instead of heading somewhere quiet and unassuming, he heads straight for Sin City. While in Las Vegas, Danny enters into a relationship, but like the rest of his life, it's volatile to say the least. The name of his boyfriend is not available, but what is known is that they fought a lot. After one particularly heated battle, Daniel, who seemed always to be escalating, grabbed a knife before stabbing his boyfriend 29 times. He did not survive. Somehow, Daniel was able to convince the jury that it was a crime of passion, and because of that, he was only found guilty of manslaughter. He was given 10 years for his crime. Chapter 3. For some reason, a lot of things seem to happen after three years for Danny, and once again following that pattern, three years after he murders his boyfriend, he finds himself on work release from the prison where he is serving his time. Seeing an opportunity, he escapes. Running back to California, Daniel makes it to Oakland and almost immediately commits another serious crime. Somewhere on his way from Nevada to California, Danny finds a car as well as a handgun, and using both, he kidnaps a woman, forcing her into his car. She was just minding her own business when the crazy looking man shoved a gun into her face. One second she was walking down the sidewalk and the next she was staring down the barrel and being ordered to get into a random car. He was definitely crazy and he just kept yelling at her, telling her he was going to rape her then kill her over and over, getting more detailed with every retelling. She was absolutely terrified, but she knew that if she didn't do something soon, her life was going to end. Reaching out slowly and using her body to shield her motions from her kidnapper, she carefully reached out and grabbed the door handle before pulling the latch and throwing the door open. 
In the same motion, she threw herself out of the speeding car before hitting the ground hard and rolling to a painful stop. Luckily, she was not run over by any of the other cars out that day, and police were soon called about a woman who had jumped out of a moving car on the Golden Gate Bridge. When officers arrived on scene, they took down her harrowing tale. Just over 24 hours later, Danny was arrested while harassing prostitutes on the streets of Oakland. Soon, he was transported back to Nevada, and because of his escape, an entire year was added onto his 10-year sentence, a move that would be rather pointless when he is paroled in 1985 after only serving six of the 11 years he was sentenced to. During his parole hearing, Danny was informed that one of the conditions of his parole was that he report back to San Francisco where he was to face the kidnapping charges. To the surprise of absolutely no one, Danny never showed up in San Francisco for his court appointment. Chapter 4. Late December, 1985. Donald Hendren was driving from Los Angeles, California to Talladega, Alabama, where he had been offered a job working for the Alabama Institute for the Deaf and Blind. Donald had already made it across California and most of Arizona when he stopped and picked up a hitchhiker who introduced himself as one Daniel Spence. Daniel, for his part, was nice enough, seemed to be able to carry on a conversation, and like Donald, was into the arts. In fact, Donald was going out to the AIDB, the Alabama Institute for the Deaf and Blind, to be their new theatrical program director, and after getting to know his new hitchhiking friend, even offered him a place if he ever wanted to put his artistic talents towards something like set design. Daniel told Donald that yeah, he was interested, but first he had to find a way to Illinois where he was going to visit his parents. Pulling into Jackson, Mississippi, The pair said their goodbyes before Donald gave Daniel his phone number, telling him to call if and when he ever became interested in the theater. Donald then drove to Alabama and to his new job. January 20th, 1985, Talladega, Alabama. Donald is surprised to see Daniel, or Danny, actually show up to the AIDB. He didn't really think he'd ever see the man again, but to his surprise, he had been wrong. Danny had decided to take the gig after all, and when he was told that this would be a voluntary position and not paid work, he didn't even bat an eye. Donald then said he could offer Danny free meals in the cafeteria, but for now, that was all he could really do. Without even taking time to consider, and without a background check run on him, Danny joined the department, and was soon working alongside the students to build the sets needed for the school's upcoming plays. Danny even stayed with Donald on campus as well, while the two men looked for an apartment they could share somewhere off campus. About one week after showing up unannounced, the two new friends moved into the Porter Apartments, a small group of buildings located on Highway 21 in Talladega, Alabama. And though Danny had been in a same-sex relationship before, this was not the case this time, and soon he began dating a 24-year-old student of the AIDB, single mother, Sherry Weathers. Sherry was deaf and had been so since birth and was attending the AIDB to learn printing and was planning on moving back to her hometown of Dothan, Alabama as soon as she graduated. She was a good mom and her two sons, five-year-old Chad and four-year-old Joey, but soon her taste in men was going to come back to haunt her. February 19th, 1985. Donald headed back to his apartment that he shared with Danny Siebert one last time. He picked up the last of his belongings before making plans with Danny to pick him up the next morning at 8 in order to take him to work. He didn't really want to move out and had only been living there for about a month, but he just didn't want to be too closely associated with Danny, just in case Danny's relationship with Sherry was sniffed out by other faculty at the school. Danny knew the rule, knew that he wasn't supposed to be engaging in a relationship with any of the students, but just like all the other rules he had broken throughout his life, Danny just didn't care. After Donald had left with the rest of his belongings, Danny stopped by a neighbor's apartment where he ate lunch with Stephen Laney and his girlfriend, Linda Odom. After the meal, Stephen Laney then left the apartment to go run some errands, 
before returning an hour later to find that not only was Danny gone, but so was Linda. Heading to Danny's apartment, Stephen knocked on the door, and getting no response, he decided to wait. Fifteen minutes later, and after occasional knocks, Danny finally answered the door where he told Stephen that he didn't know where Linda was, but he could help look for her if Stephen wanted. They looked everywhere they could think of, but in the end, they struck out. After not finding Linda, Danny asked Stephen for a ride to his girlfriend's apartment, and Stephen agreed to take him. Approximately 24 hours later on February 20th, Sherry, Danny, and another woman by the name of Linda Jarman went out to a local convenience store where they bought beer before heading back to Sherry's to play cards. Sherry then headed over to one of her neighbor's homes, the home of Fettus Porter, where she left a note for him to come over and play cards as soon as he got off work, which he did at around 10.30 that night. Upon his arrival to Sherry's apartment, Fettus saw that only Sherry and Linda Jarman were there, and the two women told him that Danny had just left a few minutes ago to get more beer, and as soon as he got back, they would start playing cards. An hour and a half later, with still no sign of Danny, Fettus Potter decides to call it a night. Meanwhile, across town, Danny, using Linda's car, drove back to his own apartment instead of the convenience store nearby. He was seen by Stephen Laney carrying large green trash bags from his apartment down the stairs to his borrowed car. When Stephen asked Danny what he was doing, Danny told Stephen that he had just finished having a huge fight with his girlfriend and the trash bags were full of her stuff that he was on his way to return. As soon as Stephen left, Danny's real work began. Heading back to his apartment, he stared down at the lifeless form of Linda Odom. He probably should have felt bad about helping his neighbor look for his girlfriend after Danny had killed her, but he really didn't feel much at all. Picking up the lifeless form, he wrapped the body in a sheet before wrestling it over to the window, where using another sheet, he tied the bundle together and lowered it out of the window to the ground. Then hurrying outside, down the stairs and to the covered form, he lifted Linda and placed her in the back of his borrowed car before driving her out to the middle of nowhere. He relived the moment he had killed her in his mind as he drove, the feeling of her throat collapsing underneath his hands as he squoze the life out of her. It just felt so good. Finding the perfect spot next to what looked like an old abandoned cemetery, Danny pulled over to the side of the road where he unceremoniously dumped Linda's body. Before leaving, Danny ferociously beat and kicked the dead woman, only stopping when he had exhausted himself. He never gave a reason as to why. After he had disposed of Linda, Danny returned back to Sherry's apartment to find her still awake but alone, as her two boys were already asleep in their room. Later, he claimed he did what he did because Sherry was not only deaf but a single mother, and because of that, she would never really amount to anything, so if he really thought about it, he was actually doing her a favor. Without making enough noise to wake up Sherry's two children, Danny was able to overpower her, where like Linda Odom before, he strangled her to death. Moving to the boys' room, he then strangles each of Sherry's children before dragging them all into the same room where he literally stacked them on top of each other before covering them with a sheet. After leaving Sherry Weathers' apartment, Danny made his way to the apartment of Linda Jarman where he explained to her that he and Sherry had just had a big fight and how he was drunk and how he needed a place where he could just sleep it off. Linda, wanting to help, let Danny in and poured him a glass of wine before sitting down with him and chatting for about an hour. As they talked, Danny began to make advances towards Linda and according to him anyways, they eventually moved their conversation to the bedroom where Danny, like Sherry before her, strangled Linda Jarman to death. As he leaves Linda's apartment, Danny grabs Linda's VCR hoping to pawn it for cash, and he also grabs her car keys as well. He then leaves all four victims in the rearview mirror. Chapter 5 Sunday, February 23, 1986. Billy Kyle was a neighbor of Sherry's and also attended the AIDB with her as well. He was a quiet man and, like Sherry, was also deaf as well as being a little different. Billy was slow by most standards and sometimes had a little trouble communicating, but he was kind 
and always looked out for those around him, especially fellow students of the AIDB. Billy was worried now. He hadn't seen his neighbor Sherry in a few days, and he was scared that something might have happened to his friend, or even worse, something might have happened to one of her two sweet boys. Heading to her apartment, he knocked but got no response. Knowing that if Sherry was home alone, she wouldn't be able to hear his knocking, he made his way to a window where he looked inside to see if he could see any signs of life. Noticing that the window was cracked open, Billy pushes the gap open wider before carefully climbing inside. Slowly, he makes his way through Sherry's home, eventually coming to her bedroom door, where he peeked through an opening. Seeing a foot hanging over the side of the bed, Billy immediately became scared and ran back to the open window before once again climbing through. The next morning, Billy confided in an AIDB social worker what he had done and relayed how scared he was not only for Sherry, but her two boys as well. Feeling the young man's clear emotions, Wanda Hunley promises to check on Sherry and her boys. Wanda then made a few calls and soon learned that nobody had seen or heard from Sherry in the last few days, and soon a group is formed with the goal of performing a welfare check on Sherry at her home. Speaking to the building manager, the group is given a master key to the apartment, and soon they are opening the door, only to be greeted by a sickening odor emanating from one of the rooms. Sherry, Chad, and Joey are found dead, and the scene, carefully constructed by Danny Siebert, is finally turned over to police. Three hours into processing the grisly crime scene, officers get another call. Another student has been reported missing from the AIDB, and she, like Sherry, is also a resident at the Sunrise Apartments. Checking on the student, they discover the body of Linda Jarman, and like the other bodies in the apartment complex, she appeared to have been strangled as well. Checking back with the school, a third person has been reported missing as well, a man by the name of Daniel Spence he immediately became their number one suspect. Fingerprints lifted from both of the scenes were placed into a police database, and instead of coming back to a Daniel Spence, they came back to a Daniel Siebert. Soon a bolo was issued for Daniel, or Danny as he was known, and a description of Linda Jarman's car was also sent out, and now police were looking for a yellow 1973 Buick with Alabama plates. At the same time, police also learned that their suspect has already been found guilty and done time for one murder, and he was also wanted in California on first-degree assault charges. Police then make their way to Danny's last known address, where they run into his neighbor, Stephen Laney. Stephen then tells officers that he hasn't seen Danny for a couple of days, before also telling officers that not only is Danny missing, but Stephen's girlfriend, Linda Odom, is missing as well. Not long after officers contact Stephen Laney, Linda Jarman's car is found on the side of the road near Elizabethtown, Kentucky, some 350 miles north of Talladega. Apparently, Danny had abandoned the Buick after getting a flat tire. Then, in a secluded area near the vehicle, officers found a makeshift campsite full of usable evidence. There were identity documents for Chad, Joey, and Sherry Weathers, as well as Linda Jarman. Also found were photos of the victims, cosmetics, and drawings of the Weathers family. They also discover an address book belonging to Danny Siebert, and the man's fingerprints were everywhere. Chapter 6 By March 8, 1986, more than two weeks after he committed the mass murder in Talladega, Danny Siebert was in Atlantic City and quickly running out of money. He was staying at Caesars Atlantic City Hotel and Casino and was on his last night before he ran out of money when passing a room, he saw an older woman alone with the door open. Beatrice McDougall of Schenectady, New York was a 57-year-old guide for Wade Tours. A proud mother of three, Beatrice had been working for the tour company part-time for about eight months and she loved her job. She loved entertaining the guests as they made their way to their destinations and often led the bus and group sing-alongs as well as various games, including bingo. Beatrice was bright, energetic, and extremely popular amongst the guests and had been working almost every Saturday guiding one-day gambling trips. That day, Beatrice was sitting in room 434 at Caesars Atlantic City Hotel and Casino, a room that had been specifically set aside for the tour guides, a place where they could take a break while the tour group was enjoying the casino. 
She had left the door open, but was still startled when a man walked into the room before shutting the door behind himself. She tried to scream, but nothing would come out of her mouth, and before she realized what had even happened, the man was on top of her, and she felt two sharp blows into her stomach. Then she felt the blood. Adrenaline flowing, she tried to stand up, but the man pushed her back down before straddling her and wrapping something around her neck. Lungs burning, Beatrice's vision begins to fade. At around 9 p.m., when the tour bus was ready to leave, Beatrice was nowhere to be found. Calling the general manager of Wade Tours, the bus driver asked what he should do if he should wait or just leave without her. Mr. Peters, the manager on duty, told the driver to wait an extra 30 minutes for Beatrice, and if she wasn't back by the end of the allotted time, he should leave without her so that the patrons could get back at a reasonable hour. After hanging up with Mr. Peters, the bus driver then called hotel security, who said they had no knowledge of Beatrice or her whereabouts. 30 minutes later, with still no sign of Beatrice, the driver left. Not long after, a hotel employee found Beatrice's body in room 434. It was the first murder in any Atlantic City casino since they were first built in 1978. Two weeks after the unconnected murder of Beatrice McDougall, a discovery was made. At the end of a dirt road in Talladega County, Alabama, sits a cemetery. It's small, quiet, and remote, the perfect place to dump a body. Next to the skeletonized remains was an ID, Linda Odom. Almost a thousand miles away in New Jersey, Danny Siebert sits in a jail cell after he was arrested for assaulting a woman. He was sentenced to 61 days, and the whole time, not only does nobody realize that he is wanted in multiple different states, but prison officials don't even know his real name. They think they have a Mr. Chad Weathers, because at the time of his arrest, the only identification Danny provided was one of the social security cards he stole from the Weathers home. So not only did he murder Chad Weathers, but he also stole his identity as well. June 1986 Chad Weathers, a.k.a. Danny Siebert, is released after serving 61 days for assault, and not long after walking out of the jail doors, Danny is in a stolen vehicle and heading southwest. He is then pulled over while passing through New Kent County, Virginia, and when officers run the tags, they are alerted to the fact that it's stolen, so Danny is once again placed under arrest. When the car is searched, officers find ropes, knives, women's clothing, and a handful of photos. When the man driving the stolen vehicle is asked for ID, Danny hands over Joey Weathers' social security card, thinking that since it worked with Chad's card, he might as well try it again. Not only relying on the social security card, officers also run the suspect's fingerprints, and there is no match. Due to a malfunction in the system, Danny's fingerprints come back clean, and his Joey persona remains intact. For a second time since committing mass murder, Danny is arrested, charged, and found guilty of a crime without his true identity ever being uncovered. After serving his sentence, Danny is released and this time he heads out to Maryland where he assaults a woman, but this time he isn't caught. Knowing officers in the area have a description of him, he next heads back west towards Nashville, Tennessee. Chapter 7 Six months pass with police still unable to locate Danny Siebert, and officers were in the middle of getting him put on the FBI's most wanted list when a phone call comes in from one of Danny's exes in Las Vegas. She relays to officers that Danny had been in contact with her, but he wouldn't tell her where he was. Trying to get any useful information, detectives ask if she had anything, no matter how small, and she stated that she knew what time zone he was in and that she heard rain and thunder in the background as they spoke. But other than that, she has nothing. After hanging up, detectives immediately call the National Weather Service, and at the time of the phone call from Danny to his ex, there was only one thunderstorm in the time zone the ex had given them, Tennessee. 
Now they had enough information to run a trace. Officers were able to pinpoint a call to the booth outside of a convenience store in Hurricane Mills, Tennessee. Speaking to the store owner, officers learned that he had recently met an artist who was traveling through the area and had commissioned a few signs from him and that the man was going to be coming back the next morning in order to pick up his check. Officers spent the night staking out the building, determined not to miss any sign of Daniel Lee Siebert. Early the next morning, Danny shows up and is immediately arrested, and to the officer's surprise, Danny remains calm and cooperative with the only words coming out of his mouth being, quote, How did you guys find me? End quote. Finally, after almost half a year of searching, detectives had their prime suspect in the murders of Sherry, Chad, and Joseph Weathers, as well as Linda Odom and Linda Jarman. As they questioned him, Danny was forthcoming about the murders, admitting to every one with little to no emotion. He also admitted to killing Beatrice McDougall in Atlantic City, a crime they had no idea was even tied to him. Continuing his story, Danny then admits to another murder, stating that during one of the nights when Donald Hendren, his boss at the AIDB, was still living with him, Danny had stolen his car before driving to Birmingham, Alabama, where he picked up a 19-year-old prostitute. He then robbed her and murdered her before dumping her body in an illegal trash dump on the side of the road near Ohachi, Alabama. Next, officers are able to finally question Danny about something that had been on their minds since they discovered it in Danny's apartment. He had been in possession of a map, a map that had been marked with hand-drawn X's and O's placed sporadically on top of locations out in California. Some of the X's were standing alone on the map, while some of them had been circled with an O. Without even blinking, Danny confessed that the X's were places where he had committed a robbery, and the X's encircled by an O marked locations where he had murdered someone. Following up on the claim, detectives called law enforcement in California, and they were able to confirm that each of the locations with a circled X had been the site of a murder. Danny also confessed to killing three more women, all prostitutes from Nevada and California, but only two of those were able to be confirmed, 19-year-old Nessie McElrath and 28-year-old Gidget Castro. Nessie was from St. Louis and had headed out to sunny California, where she fell on hard times and ended up working the streets. Her father had already passed away and Nessie was buried beside him in a military cemetery back in St. Louis, Missouri. Gidget was from Hartford, Connecticut and had been born into an extremely poor family. In an ironic twist of fate, she had at one time marched with the Black Panthers, bringing awareness to the murders of black individuals back east hoping to spark change as well as bring light to the crimes that were occurring around her, only to be murdered herself years later. She was the mother of two children, one of whom's father was found guilty after he murdered a pregnant woman whom he was acquainted with. All in all, Daniel, or Danny, would admit to 13 murders, but he was only officially linked with 10. He was then tried for the murders of Sherry, Chad, and Joey Weathers, as well as the murder of Linda Jarman. After a week-long trial in which the state called 40 witnesses and introduced 147 exhibits, Daniel Lee Siebert was found guilty and sentenced to death twice. He was also given a life sentence. When asked for comment after the trial was over, he said, quote, Sherry Ann didn't have anything to say. Chad didn't have anything to say. Joey didn't have anything to say. I don't have anything to say. End quote. He then spent 21 years on death row where he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. He made one final appeal on his death penalty, stating that the medication used in the lethal injection might mix adversely with his cancer meds, causing him unnecessary pain and therefore would be cruel and unusual. His appeal was taken under consideration just hours before his death sentence was to be carried out and it was delayed so they could review the new information. Governor Bob Riley was then asked about commuting Danny's sentence, to which he replied, quote, I would in essence be commuting his sentence to life in prison, and that is not the sentence he was given by the jury. His crimes were monstrous, brutal, and ghastly. End quote. Going along with what Governor Bob Riley said about Daniel, he had spent a lot of his time in prison making disturbing drawings that he sold as murder bilia to websites specializing in sales of artwork, letters, and essays all produced by prisoners convicted of murder. In a way, Danny's final appeal worked, because on April 22, 2008, 
He died from complications from his cancer. He never made it to the execution chamber. He was 53 years old. Guess what, everyone? We have more reviews. The first one today comes from Canada from listener Burley B. Top shelf. I don't use Apple Pods, but I came here just to write a review for Chase slash Almost Fiction. It's become one of my favorite podcasts. I will literally turn off whatever else I'm listening to in favor of listening to AF. I love the format, love the storytelling, love Chase's voice. Everything just comes together so perfectly. Bravo, Chase. Keep doing what you do. Thank you, Burley B. As a half-Canadian myself, I appreciate the compliments all the more. Thank you so much for listening. Our next review comes from Poor Sodbuster from Apple Podcasts. Really good. Very good storytelling, no politics or trigger alerts. Thank you for listening, Poor Sodbuster, and I appreciate you taking the time to leave a review. I try to tell the story as it happened, and even though it comes through sometimes, I do try to keep politics out as it seems to be everywhere nowadays, and sometimes it's nice to just get a break. Our next review comes from the United Kingdom from listener S.E. Bolts. Bloody brilliant. So good. Reminds me a bit of Dark Topic, which is always a good thing. Been binge listening for two days now. Don't know why I never did before as I followed the operator since day one, so had heard mention of Almost Fiction several times, making up for lost time now. Keep up the good work. Thank you, SE Bolts. I hope you're still around and I hope you're still enjoying the show. Thank you so much for your support. Our next review comes from ADGIFKUH. It reads, Amazing. Love this podcast. Finally, some stories I haven't heard. In honesty, I do try to find cases that are not as covered, though the occasional well-covered case slips through. But, thank you so much for listening. Our last review for this week comes from Senior Night 1970. It reads, Another good show from 1159. Thank you, Mr. 1970, for that review. Short and sweet, just like I like it. Almost Fiction is a part of 1159 Media. If you want to hear more Almost Fiction, including ad-free episodes as well as bonus episodes, head on over to 1159plus.com or head over to patreon.com forward slash 1159media. There you can find out how you can help support the show as well as get access to the other content available from 1159 Media, including my other podcast, Tethers. Thank you so much for all your support, and don't forget to leave a review. Also, I'm on Cameo now, so if you want a pep talk, a birthday wish, or you want me to roast your outfit, come find me on Cameo. As always, I'm Chase Ellerman, and this is Almost Fiction.